All right. As we all found out, real time is very slow. <laughs> <laughs> Very undeterministic. Uh, I don't know <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to talk about the Linux driver model. Um, I haven't given a technical talk in a long time, so this is fun. Um, the subtitle is Web Woven by Spider on Drugs. This is a description that John Jonathan wrote many years ago about how SysFS in the driver model looks to user space, um, and it's a very good description. Um, a long time ago in the kernel, two, in the 2.4 and previous days, every single driver subsystem was standalone. SCSI didn't know about IDE, didn't know about um, CPUs, didn't know about USB, everything was standalone. And I was doing USB work and starting to do CPU or PCI work and then PCI hot plug work, and we started doing the same things all over and over and over. We did hot plug work in USB, and we had the same problems, and I was doing that in PCI, and I was looking at other places and doing this other subsystems. And then there's whole subsystems that weren't even in the kernel. Um, I2C wasn't in the kernel. Um, a whole bunch of other little ones weren't in the kernel. I was trying to drag them in. I realized we need a unified model in the kernel. We need a way for, to show everything, because there is representation between a USB disk to a SCSI disk, or USB subsystem to SCSI, between PCI to the USB to the disk to something else. Um, and there's a hierarchy that's going on in the real world, on your box, in the system. And at the same time, Pat Michel was working at OSDL, and I was working at IBM. We happened to be next door to each other. And he was working on the problem of power management, trying to suspend a laptop. And to suspend a laptop, you need to start with one device, and you can't turn off like your PCI bus controller before you turn off your disks that are talking to your, your system. You have to have a tree in the system. And then I was working at IBM at the same time, and I wanted to do persistent naming. If you plug a USB device in, you always want it to work. The big problem was you plug two USB printers in, and every time you boot, it could be the different printer. Um, you did, that isn't good for companies <laughs> when you have one that's a secure printer and one that isn't a secure printer. So we wanted deterministic naming. So we got together, and we started working on this problem. Um, the whole 2.5 development cycle was two and a half years. Pat and I broke the whole kernel so many times. It was so much fun. Um, it's something that we could never do again. <laughs> um, as long as Linus's box would build every week, maybe, we were OK. Um, and we did this. So we created a unified driver model that all subsystems and all parts of the kernel touch. Um, I ended up, I worked, wrote UDEV, um, did deterministic device naming, persistent device naming after a drunken bet. I got rid of DevFS from the kernel. Um, be very careful what you bet when you're drinking. And then um, I saw the problem. People are still arguing that the power management problem is not solved. Pat ran away to New Zealand, disappeared for a while. Um, he's back, though, which is good. And um, so we're still doing power management problems. Um, Raphael at, at Intel is still working on the power management problem. Because it turns out a tree, a nice pretty graph, is not really how power management works. Devices talk across the bottom sometimes. But we're not going to get into that. So let's talk about what we have today. This is the most important thing. None of this affects anybody here. I would be very amazed. Well, John. <laughs> One person. <laughs> um, the problem is um, the driver model handles most all the stuff. And I'm going to talk about stuff below the driver model as well. Um, if you, unless you're writing a driver subsystem, you don't care. Um, if you are writing a driver subsystem, you do care, but hopefully most of the work has already been done for you. Um, there's a few things, like the, very, the next slide and the very last slide I'll t get into, that you might care if you're writing a driver. Otherwise, this is just interesting things. <coughs> Let's talk about this. Um, we're going to talk at the, start at the very bottom and work our way up. Uh, there's a chapter in the Linux Device Drivers book that John and I wrote and um, Alexandro, um, that goes into all this. It's out of date, it's obsolete, and we just got an official email today from O'Reilly that there's never going to be a fourth edition. Uh, which is fine. It, they, created, they were working on a fourth edition without ever talking to us. Anyway, um, but there's not going to be one. So um, with the documentation that we have, there is a lot of in-kernel documentation for, doc, uh, for the driver model, for KREP, for K-objects. I think I'll move it all to we have now. It should be able to work better. So I think if we dump the chapter into the kernel, keep it up to date, we might be a, have a better idea. 
because it, people do like documenting things. Um, when Pat and I were working on the driver model, we started working at the device level. Um, Al Vero saw this work and said, no, we need to make it more generic. Let's make it at the k-object level. All objects in the kernel need to take advantage of this. We didn't quite make it as far as we wanted to, but we pulled things out of a device and made it more generic. So file systems now, they're not devices, but they interact with some things. And then with the reference counting that we were doing in there, we boiled it down even farther. So there's a static, there's a structure in the kernel to handle reference counting. It has no lock in it. Um, you have to have a release function because you want to reference count some memory and you want to pass that reference around to other people and you want to use that. So never ever write your own reference counting. Use what we have. It's documented, it's debugged. Um, of proof of some of the nasty race conditions, proving that the stuff works right, um, Peter and I and a whiteboard and another graduate student at the university last year took an hour to prove that a six-line function in the KREF code was correct. And it was. But it's very tricky, nasty stuff. I mean, literally, it took us a long time to figure out, yeah, it does handle all the, ref all the race conditions and whatnot, and it is correct. Use it. For you to be able to figure out how to reproduce it without using this stuff, it's probably going to be wrong. Just use it. Handles it all. There is no locks, but because you need your own lock, you have to lock outside the object that you're protecting because you want to be able to make sure that the device, if the last, it can go away, and it isn't going away when you try and grab another reference. The documentation kind of explains it. Use a lock. You pass it to the functions. It's good stuff. Um, let's move one step up. So now we have something called K objects. These were kernel objects. Alviro created this, started using them in a file system, and started using them in the char level, or char layer. So um, objects in the kernel, when they talk to user space, are usually character devices or block devices. Um, Alviro fixed the character devices so we could have thousands upon thousands of them. We broke the minor number barrier or the major number barrier, and he used K objects to do this stuff. It's a basic object type. Um, it also takes all the basic functionality of what you need for an object and represents it in SysFS. So you don't have to do all the, doc all, the re all the virtual file system stuff. All the stuff is there. And these glue the objects together. There's basic functions in there that glue everything together. It does a hierarchy. It does all sorts of sun or all sorts of fun things. It handles hot plug event notification. We tell user space when objects disappear, when they come back, um, if they change, lots of different stuff. All that's handled automatically for you. Nobody should ever need to use a K object. <laughs> if you use a K object in any of your code and you're not a file system developer, it's wrong. No driver author should ever use a K object. If you're using a K object, something's wrong. There's a lot level higher things for you. Um, I apologize to the file system developers. Um, they do use K objects. It's bad. There's a K object in the char structure for when you're getting a character major and minor number. Never use that. It is not what you think it is. It's this weird fake K object that Alvero used. I need to just rename it somehow someday to something. Because a lot of people try registering it, they try, they try naming it, and then I get angry email about why it isn't working and why it isn't showing up in SysFS. It's not used for that. It's used for the reference counting. Don't use it. <laughs> um, again, if you ever try using a raw K object on something, your code's wrong. And that's proof of that. So, K objects. Um, so I talked about SysFS. So SysFS has files. A K, a K object is a directory in SysFS, but SysFS needs files, and files are attributes, so struct attributes. Um, there are all the files. The rule in SysFS is one text value per file. Tiny number. You're only given a page of data, but really you should, be, you should never have to worry about how much you're reading or writing in SysFS. One tiny text value. Um, there was a really bad example of how this was abused. A CPU frequency driver was printing out a histogram of the past five minutes of what happened <laughs> in a SysFS file. Pretty. It was very, pretty nice. It had the X and Y axis on it and things like that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, there's some, there's some um, driver staging code right now. I found a subsystem that had a big, long table and pretty graph, almost a graph, but not, it looked like an Excel spreadsheet table of data in a SysFS file. <laughs> I'm like, no, um, don't do that. The reason we do one value per file is that we want to do the, we won't, don't want the same problem that happened with PROC. PROC has a lot of files that have a lot of values. And if you add or remove a value in a table in a PROC file, you break user space. If you add or remove, so SysFS, if the file is not there, the value is not there. It's that simple. 
It makes a much more flexible way to write user space code. Your user space code, if you're ever reading SysFS files and whatnot, should be able to gracefully degrade if the file isn't there. Because sometimes files change, they sometimes move around, but they should always, hopefully they'll be there, but they do move. And they do rename and things like that. If it renames, I mean the value is different, so your tool should be able to handle that. And that's been very powerful and it's allowed us to change APIs slowly over time without breaking things. Changing things in proc is very scary because we don't know what we break. And we break a lot of things sometimes, right? <laughs> Um, there's a way to group attributes together. They're called attribute groups. Um, that's how you should work with an attribute. Um, you can work with attributes for drivers and devices and whatnot. You should never manage these files individually. Um, you can write functions for them individually, but never, as you handle them and pass them around the kernel, pass them around as groups. <laughs> it's much more powerful. You can name them. You can move them as groups. You can do fun things with them. You can create subdirectories. Use the group. There's the group interface is in the kernel. I'm slowly moving more subsystems to use it. Um, it's getting better over time. It handles some race conditions. It's fun. Um, SysFS files should all be documented in the documentation ABI directory in the kernel. Um, it turns out everything's documented as a testing thing, and there's testing files that have been there for 15 years, but it's all documented. So everything should be documented. Sometimes you'll get a little nasty email from me saying, you added a new SysFS file. Why haven't you documented it? Please just do that. Okay, so K or F, K objects. Now, how do we tie K objects together? There's two things we use for that. There's something called a K set. Um, we just group K objects together. Something like um, the same type of something. So maybe these are USB devices, or maybe there's some other type of thing. A K set handles that. It's some structures in there. It links them together. It allows us to iterate over K objects in a race-free way, and it ties them all together. It works out pretty well. And then on top of that, we need to know what type of K object you have. Because you can have sets of K objects that are not necessarily, they're logically together, kind of the same, but they don't always, they're not always the same type, because sometimes you want to do something different with them. I'll talk a little bit more about that later with the driver model. The driver model allows you to have devices on the same bus that are different types, and you use K object types. But K object type is also the thing that holds all the functions for this K object set of structures that you want to do something with. So it's a whole bunch of function pointers. Um, it handles the SysFS function. Um, there's also stuff for namespaces. SysFS can handle namespaces. Thankfully, it's only enabled for networking um, because it gets very nasty afterwards. Um, so SysFS name networking um, is correct based on the namespace you're in. because That changes names. Um, and there's a release function for your K object is in the K object type. Releases is very important. The kernel will yell at you if you ever give it an empty release function, don't try and work around that by providing a release function that does nothing. It's like you're trying to outsmart the kernel. Um, there's documentation in the documentation directory that nobody reads that says, if you are trying to work around this, I get to publicly make fun of you. And about every three months, I do. Um, if, if the kernel's giving you a warning, that meant I went to extra effort to try and protect you from yourself. Don't try and work around that protection. Um, the kernel's is smarter than you here. <laughs> it's a dynamic type. What? You need to use the selection way that basically says that when someone does the VS code that you use this stuff incorrectly, you get error message to caught you more Oh, that'd be good. <laughs> Thomas also uses functions like he has attributes, and I wish I should use a C as fun. It's hard in C to hide attributes of a structure. It's things like don't ever use this, this reference or um, something like that on an IRQ like this long. And then he greps for it. Like every six months he'll grep and he'll find people that used it. <laughs> um, in, the, in the K object in the driver model, I do, I had to hide structures behind other structures. Then I try and get around that and people still use it. C is fun. Um, anyway, name spacing. So K object types. It's messy, it's weird. Um, this is different from the, um, device or the Linux device driver book. We didn't have K object types 10 years ago. We had something called subsystems and a little different model. We've cleaned it up and it works a little bit better now. So the device driver book is out of date, sorry. So that's the low level functionality. Now let's move on one up above it. Oh, actually there's something below her. K objects is SysFS and there's something below. Tejan wrote something below SysFS called KernFS to handle even something lower than that. But hopefully you don't ever have to mess with that. Um, struct device. This is what people and drivers see. Well, no. You see something on top of struct device. Um, I'm saying things on top of and whatnot. If you notice, we're doing object 
objects in C. We do multiple inheritance in C. We do object overload in C in a way. Um, C can do very good object-oriented programming. It's a pain. Sometimes I really wish I had C++, but we do this. So it's all in C, and it is a very object-oriented model. Um, the functionality is there. You can do object-oriented programming in assembly. It's hard, but you can do it. We do it in C all over the place in the kernel. Again, struct device, universal structure. Everybody has this. What we took, a lot of devices had the same thing. Like a lot of devices cared about the DMA memory pointers. They had platform data. It pointers to where the firmware information was. They had a name. They had all the stuff. Um, IOMU information. We sucked that all together into one structure. Everybody shares this. We pass it around the kernel. Buses and classes use this. So a device is two type of things. It can be a physical device or it can be a logical device. Logical device is something like an input. Uh, device, you have um, a U event or a, what? What's the weird input devices that resolve? But you have different types of input devices, um, disks, you can have block devices, but you have a physical disk. So a disk will have a device and a block will be a device, things like that. We unified it all. Works pretty well. On top of that, because now we need to have devices, we have different device types. So USB is a great example of this. USB has a whole bunch of Structure for a USB device, we have a device, we have an interface, we have endpoints, we have a port. These all belong on the USB bus, but they are different types. So you can have same collections of, U of same devices, you can iterate over them, but we have a type. You can kind of check to see what's going on. It works out pretty well. Um, we've had to add this over the years for different things. Um, the gray bus subsystem that handled for the new phone that a bunch of us have worked on um, has different types on the same bus. It's a little way to do hierarchy. It works out well. And then we get into fun things like drivers. So drivers actually control a device. So you write a driver of a specific bus type, which will wrap the core device driver type. Handles the probe, removes, suspend all the power management, and default attributes. So a driver can handle default attributes depending on its type. So USB drivers all end up with the same type of attributes, same type of devices. This is how that works out. So buses will end up wrapping this type of stuff. And then talking about buses, we have a bus type. And buses are hard. Um, I'll apologize for buses a lot. Um, it's hard to ride a bus. And buses get complex and they get messy. But this is how you bind drivers and devices together. So it has to manage both the drivers and it has to manage the devices. You have to come up with functions for how to match those drivers to the devices because every bus type does that differently. We can't do it in a generic way. But it works that way. Um, it handles the U events for when they're added and removed because we add some more bus stuff. It handles shutdown. I don't know why it just handles shutdown and not some of the other things, but it worked out for some buses. Um, power management comes in kind of the side, um, but shutdown can be overridden by the bus type. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I don't know why. It's grown over the years. When you go back and look at things, you wonder why the warts came about. So bus. So there are some people that have to write a bus. Um, bus code, so USB bus, hardware monitor, I2C. Um, it's hard to write a bus. Um, it's about three to 400 lines of code. It's complex, it's tricky at spots. Um, it's, I apologize for it. Um, it was one of those things I thought very few people would be writing buses, so we never spent a lot of time to optimize. Turns out we add one or two new buses every kernel release. So there's always at least one developer that's really mad at me. Um, and it also means that I have to review a new bus about every three months. Um, on my to-do list to make them easier, but it's hard. I'm sorry. But they're complex. They have to register buses. You have to register your devices. And I'll go into a few steps on what you have to do with some of these things. But they're complex things because you're interacting with the hardware type. You have to handle how you handle your hardware. And then you also have to handle how you handle the driver model. So it's this middle ground that we don't provide a whole lot of helper functions for. And it could be easier. So. A bus has to create a device. Here's an example of something that's complex. You have to create, set the bus type. You have to set the parent of where it is in the tree, set the default attribute groups. You have to initialize the device. You can do other magic things depending on your bus. And then you have to tell the driver core it's added. And then the driver core takes away and goes off. And then we'll try and match the driver or the device to a driver that you had previously registered. So it's going to call back into your bus again. It's tricky and it's messy. Um, you, can sub, you can do some smaller things in some places by combining device initialize and device add into one call called device register, but usually it all ends up being like this. Again, three to 400 lines of just boilerplate code. Sorry. 
Um, so you want the two-step process. The two-step process here is interesting. Um, device initialize lets the driver core know that here comes a device. I set up some pointers. And usually, when you have a device, you want to t add a bunch of attributes to it. You want to customize it. You want to add some attributes depending on the type, maybe not other ones. But when you add a device and when you, make a when you tell user space the device is present, it's going to go out there and try to read all the files. It's going to try and see what is there. And if you start adding files after you already added the device, user space will miss those files. There's a race condition. So what you do is you add a whole bunch of SysFS files, you do some other weird things in the middle in your bus, and then you tell user space the device is really there. It's a little intermediate step, but it prevents races from happening, because user space wants to go out there and find devices. And that race condition happens a lot. Hopefully most user space tools that care about this stuff work around this, um, but that race condition happens a lot. Um, so it's something to be watched out for. In your drivers and in your devices, um, you can watch out for this, but you want to always populate SysFS with everything you have before you tell user space it's there. It's most like most driver um, initialization, you want to initialize everything before you tell the kernel that it's able to use the device. Same thing with user space. You want to get everything there before you tell user space it's really there. Um, and again, for a bus, you have to register a driver. So you have to manage not only devices, but you have to manage the drivers that bind to those devices. You have to register, you have to bus type, set up the probe, set who owns the module, because the module ownership needs to handle for the reference counting for when a device and a driver is bound together so your module won't get unloaded, and fun things like that. And then you have to register a driver with a driver core. It's messy. It's complex. And that's the last I apologize. Class. So if I'm ever known for one thing in the world, that. No C++ compiler can ever build the kernel. <laughs> uh, there's a struct class in the kernel now. Um, it was a fun hack. It's lived a long, long time. This t so drivers and devices and buses are for things that are a physical bus or maybe a semi-virtual bus. Like a USB serial bus is a logical bus that we have serial devices hanging off of a USB device. There's a logical bus there. Classes are how devices interact with user space. So again, input devices, PWM, GPIOs, TTY devices, block devices, they're classes. And since when we first started writing on the driver model, we thought classes are going to be um, complex. There's going to be a lot of them. Let's make it really easy to do this. It takes about 30, 20 to 30 lines of code to write a class. Very simple, very easy, hard to get wrong. We made this code work well. It's kind of like a bus, but it isn't because you don't have drivers binding to it. So the complexity isn't there, and it's easy to write one. It handles suspend resume, because sometimes you want to suspend and resume your user space devices. And then it handles the release, the cleaning of them up, and whatnot. It handles default attributes. Or if you don't want to do any of that, you can get away with like three or four lines of code to create a class. Create one dynamically, and away you go. Works out really well. Struct class is fun. Um, we tried merging buses and classes together a long time ago. Created something called subsystems. There's code in UR and UDEV that's been there for like eight to maybe 10 years now that handles the fact that SysFS might radically change its way it works. Merge all the, merge the classes and the buses together. Um, we did it, we ran it on a bunch of our machines for a long time. It turned out not to be very useful because um, people liked the class. The class interface was tiny, it was small, it's easy. Um, so we stuck to what we have now. But if we ever do break user space by moving all these things around, your user space tools won't break because they've been, the code out there is still living, which is kind of funny. So that's how you break user space APIs. You get user space code merged five years before you change the kernel. Then nobody notices. Except Andrew Morton and his one weird machine that he has in the corner. Um, so struct classes. So what a class has to do, it can do all these funny things, but it doesn't have to do that. But when you have a class, you're usually talking about major and minor numbers because you're doing a character or a block device. So you just register the class or you create it dynamically, register your major or minor, use it in a function called device create. So you still have devices that are bound to your class, but creating and managing the devices are very easy. You can call one function, device create, driver core creates it automatically, binds it to your class, handles all the SysFS stuff, and you're done. When you're done with it, you call device destroy, Everybody's happy, everything cleans up nicely, you free your major minor number, and then you can do suspend or resume if you really care about it. Um, I think input devices care about it. Um, some, but some classes do, some classes don't. You don't have to if you don't want to, but the functionality is there. And that's it. So that's the driver model. You got buses, you got devices, and you got classes. 
Um, it's messy in some places. Um, the, the documentation that's in the kernel is pretty up to date as of a couple years ago. I'll go back through and try and clean it up more. But um, it shows examples. Um, there's good examples and bad examples of what you should look at. Do not use USB as a good example. <laughs> um, when we created the driver model, um, we used whiteboards all the time. And we're like, hey, this will work fine for PCI. And I disappear for a day. I'm like, oh, but USB breaks. And then come back, oh, this USB has these other hacks. So USB is complex and messy. And it isn't as bad as some of them, but the model, the way USB uses the driver model, is pretty much stretching it to its limitations. So there's a lot simpler implementations if you want to make a look at the driver model. Look at the USB to serial bus I talked about earlier. It's simple. It's tiny. It's maybe under 300 lines of code. Um, there's good, clean examples if you want to look at things like that. So that works. So let's talk about, or any questions? But I got some examples. And then there's food. Um, so the driver core itself handles a lot of complexity. And um, here's an example of it. So when you want to shut down a machine, it has to walk all the devices in the system. And devices can be belong to a class or to a bus. And here's how the callback mess starts up. So if a device actually has a class and the class has a shutdown function, then we'll call it and everybody's good and the device will go away. But if it's on a bus, then if the bus has a shutdown function, then we call the device, the bus that's attached to that device's shutdown function, but then that function has to then go back and call the driver that's attached to that device to tell it to shut down. It's pointers to pointers to pointers. Um, it's messy, but that handles the complexity of how you do the hierarchy and everything. Um, that shows you how messy buses can be because buses have to handle the drivers because you end up writing a driver for a specific bus and you need to know how to do that specific thing for that specific type of device. So it's tricky. Um, this just gives you an example of what the driver core has to handle. Power management for um, dynamic power management is even trickier, but um, normal power shut or suspend resume kind of does the same type of logic. There's hooks all over it. Um, there's now a whole special subdirectory in the driver core called power that handles a lot of this stuff. But if you look in there, these functions just do all these crazy, all this pointer in direction. Sometimes it can get very, very long. But that works. This is what controls all machines in the world that runs the world economy. Yeah. I left it out of the slide. I left out device type out of the slide. Um, device types are usually handled in the bus itself, though. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes we think that um, so bus types are are not used that often. There's I think only four or five bus types that try and override it because they need I think probably clock does that because they have special requirements. Um, yeah, types are messy. Um, Raphael is now messing with we're doing pointers across the bottom of the tree because clock is a really good example of you might need a clock device for your I2C over here, but you had power that registered this. So you shouldn't bring up your I2C device before the clock comes up, and then you need to shut this down before you shut this one down. So you need to have some hierarchy of knowing across the bottom of the trees where everything is. It turns out to be a directed graph that, or cyclical graph at times, and how do you resolve that? Uh, we have other problems of sometimes we can't bind drivers to devices until another device is bound to a driver. So we now do some deferred probing. So you can say, I'm not ready to be bound to my driver, so come back later. And then I'll come back later and try it again, and try it again, and try it again. It's a very dumb, simple solution, but it works. Um, we try dumb, simple solutions. Um, so yeah, it's, sometimes, it's messy. Yeah, power management, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> All right, anything else about the driver core? Questions? All right, here's some things. So if you are a driver rider, now you can wake back up. Um, use attribute groups only. If you ever call a sysfs function, you're doing something wrong, with one exception. Um, attribute fi groups and files can change dynamically. And um, batteries are a great example. Battery has a file that says how much power is currently coming from your battery. User space doesn't want to sit out there and pull, pull, constantly read, constantly read, constantly read, constantly read. It wants to do a select and pull on that sysfs file. So when your value changes, you can call sysfs notify. It'll handle the pull and select. And then user space will be woken up and works fine. So sysfs notify is about the only function that 
any driver writer should ever call. Um, if you ever are writing Sisyphus calls or ever touching a K object, you're doing something wrong. Talk to me, we can figure out how to fix it. Um, maybe I should just wrap the Sisyphus one with some driver core function instead, but that's it. Um, never use platform device. Platform device. Anybody want to challenge me on that? Um, many, many years ago, we had a problem with there's some devices in your system that are just not on a bus. They're a memory map to some location, like um, your PC, your PC, old PC controller for your keyboard. Um, so the platform device, platform bus came about to be. So we just threw random devices out there. If you look on any ARM system, there's about 150 platform devices randomly. Um, a lot of those should be a real bus. The platform device interface is horribly, horribly abused. Every year I get mad at it and I should think I should rewrite it. There is a way to create virtual devices that aren't bound to something. There's a virtual device, there's a virtual bus in the system. You should be using that. I should populate, or I should make it easier and publicize it more. I started going through, uh, when I was working on this talk, and seeing how many drivers actually abuse the, the platform device interface, and I got, I lost track after about 100 or so. Um, it's bad. So if you really have a device that's on the platform and there's no other way to describe it, you can use it. Really, you shouldn't. <laughs> um, for a PC, you should never use it. I see PCs coming out that have random, they slap their I2C controller on a platform device. I don't know why, but they'd mess with it. Graphics is mess with it sometimes. Um, Andrew's not paying attention. Um, so yeah, never use a platform device if at all possible. I do, no device trade uses. So um, you should do what ACPI does. So ACPI has their own bus. And they have devices in firmware, device tree, abuses the platform device interface. I objected, but I didn't have the, I didn't have anything to say you should use it better. I know it's, it's a pain. Um, but there's some, so you can do device tree devices that use, de or then you can actually have a device that's bound to it. It kind of works. I don't object too much. And then if you look at the root of Sisyphus, they're all completely flat, and it's messy. Um, so if you're a writer, a class, again, use attributes. There's no real use for Sisyphus except Sisyphus notify. Use class create and class destroy, and you don't need to have static classes. Um, create them dynamically because they are dynamic structures. Works out really nice, um, very simple to use. If you write a class, again, 20, 30 lines of code, it's pretty simple. And then, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe I should just sit down one day and do it. Um, it's messy. Buses, writing a bus is hard. Um, every time I have to do it myself, I, I cringe. Um, that's it. Um, so some people don't use buses or drivers or devices, and they want to use raw K objects. And here's my advice. Um, unless you're a file system, <laughs> don't do it. Um, file systems represent, if you look, ext4 represents things in your, in your um, sysfs under sys file system, um, and it uses raw k objects. Um, it's hard. You end up writing a lot of boilerplate code um, uh, it's because it's hard to do. Um, I'm sorry. It could be better. Um, ACPI ended up having to write their own sysfs stuff. Um, Vice Tree, I thought, had it, but they just abused platform. Did you have to use raw k objects and stuff? Okay. Um, some people have to use it, and it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of work, and if you do use it, uh, read the documentation that we have. The documentation should tell you how to use it okay, and um, expect a really hard review cycle. It's going to be hard. There's a lot of nasty race conditions. Um, the interfaces aren't the easiest to use. Um, I'll be glad to review your code. Um, I don't think I've ever seen code come through that's been right the first time. Um, and that's probably a good indication that the APIs are bad. <laughs> so I'm going to do the review. Um, some things are hard to use to get right, um, but yeah. So that's it. Don't use raw SysFS. Never use raw K objects. Um, please don't ever use it. Um, a lot of people try doing it. Don't. That's it. So I went fast. But any questions? It's all online. Yes. Uh, so it's uh, 
Yes. So, um, instead of using that, it depends on what you're using. So, um, there are binary files in SysFS, and the binary files in SysFS, there's an attribute or there's a way to do it. That's for pass through data. So, data that's going through the kernel to the hardware, you're never interpreting it. A good example is the PCI device descriptors. They're raw binary blob. Um, you can read them directly and you can parse them in user space if you want. So that just passes through. Uh, firmware uses it to dump firmware to binary attribute. If you're trying to read and write complex files through SysFS, as you said, it's racy. It's, we don't give you the interfaces to use it. Um, KernFS. So KernFS is built, uh, or SysFS is built on top of KernFS. Um, CgroupsFS is built on top of KernFS. And it gives you the hooks to write your own virtual file system. And DebugFS is now on top of KernFS as well. Um, if you're just doing debugging stuff and you want that, use DebugFS. The only rule in DebugFS is there's no rules. <laughs> well, the rule is that you can't enable, require people to use it, but Stephen broke. <laughs> um, so you did prove that the, there is no rules. Um, you got trace of us, but I think, isn't FTrace still using DebugFS? No, you got rid of it. Entirely? So what, it uses, what uses DebugFS for tracing? Um, Okay, well, that's not bad, but, yeah, that's that's bad. Yes, um, but uh, distros don't want to enable debugfs. Until the 4.8 kernel release, debugfs was known, racy, and you could easily crash your machine using it. <laughs> yes, and that's perfect. That's what you want to do, so that's good. So, um, but debugfs is great for debugging stuff. You can use it to stream de um, data in and out. The interface to using debugfs is very, very tiny, very easy. It's simple. It's made to replace all the fact that people were dumping debug files in procfs. Um, you can create a debugfs file to manage our, um, a variable with one line of code. Just point it at the variable and the way it goes. All types are handled. Now we handle it in a race-free manner if your device, to, if things disappear while things are open. Um, it works really, really well. Uh, the fun thing with debugfs is you don't have to check the return value of the functions you call. If you check the return value, you're actually doing something wrong because debugfs can handle um, returns being incorrect and passing it bad data back into it. It works out really well. It's very robust. It's a good interface to use. Again, one or two lines and you can do things in the kernel. So use debugfs or if you want, make your own file system. You can do whatever you want and build on top of kernfs. Um, kernfs gives you the hooks in order to write, and that's on top of libfs <laughs> um, that works to make a virtual file system pretty easy. Yes. So what do I access to do, to do instead? Um, I think a lot of devices should be moved to the virtual bus. There are um, devices that are just, so I have a perfect example. Um, I got sent some debug code yesterday that was written by Google and Collabora that handles, it's a test framework to handle um, devices being discovered in a delayed manner. It's a good test framework. It creates 12 or so platform devices and then messes with them that way because they're fake devices and they want to play around with them. Those should be virtual devices because they're not real. They're not actually representing something that's actually in memory, that's actually physically out there and talking to something like that. So these are virtual devices. And there is a way in the driver model to make a virtual device. But, oh, so some are, if you have a memory bus that can back it, but then why not make it a root of your firmware that's actually discover, that describes that. So device tree describes that, and it does use platform devices. Yes. Right, so a lot of those, and I've been talking to people, those memory interconnects and that discovery and that's coming information should be buses themselves. Well, you don't have to do, okay, so you don't have to do dynamic discovery to make a bus. You can do fake, well, it's like platform does. Yeah, um... It is what platform do I, but, and there's a gray area there. So I'm saying, look at the abuse of the drivers that I just got sent that abuses driver, um, 
use this platform device because it's really easy to create devices for and throw them out there and they do things. Um, those don't actually have a backing thing. Some that do have a backing, yeah, I can agree there. Um, but other things like for my PC, there's an I2C device that really is on a bus that's described by ACPI. That should have been an ACPI device discoverable bus. Um, device tree, again, does describe things somehow. You're getting that information from something. Let's put it somewhere. Um, it, the reason we haven't got rid of platform devices is because of this argument. <laughs> and the reason it's still there is because I need to give you something to do, right, with that. And Russell, and, there's, and platform devices handle a lot of stuff for you very nicely. Um, and there's a lot of people that use it well, but there's also a lot of people that abuse it. So it's a hard, it's a fun thing. I should give a talk in the next ELC about why platform devices are bad. Have everybody yell at me. I better. That's, that's why I haven't pushed hard. I need to give you guys a better alternative. Right. So we've, we've made platform device so well and so easy to use to handle all those things. Yeah. So maybe I need to take that functionality, and this is where it comes back, to, and make it easier to write a bus that has those type of attributes. So Move that into the driver core. Platform bus isn't a bus either. No. It's actually just a, a group of callbacks that you can overwrite in various parts of what we call the bus in the driver core. It doesn't actually do anything the hardware of the bus does. No. Again, yeah, it's a, it's a shoehorn, right? But it's very flexible and very useful. Yeah. Um, yes, so I agree, and I need to give you something better. That's why I like complaining about it, but I haven't done anything to back up that complaint. So I fully admit that. And yeah. So both of you guys are right. <laughs> and I'm right. But um, because it's also really hard to write a bus, and that's one thing too. So you don't want to take the time to do that. And you shouldn't have to write 300 to 400 lines of boilerplate code just to use this best, t two tiny devices, right? It shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.